All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is March 17th, 2023, and we are going to spend some more time digging, helping people to understand mysteries that had caused confusion, and we're going to shed some more light. I'm not saying it's going to be completely revealed, completely understood, but you are definitely going to have a greater understanding than you did before. We're even going to have new tidbits, especially as it gets closer to the end. I believe I found something that confirms something I've understood for a long time. But a lot of people still like to go to John chapter 21 and this this where they think the 153 fish relate to and everything else. Well, we're going to touch on that towards the end, maybe not right at the end, right? You don't know where it's going to be, but. And it came about through doing a study just in today's, um, preparing for today's video. And it's interesting, I had said that I was gonna do this video now for a little bit, and I planned on it being the third one from when I recently said it, and it's the third one. And that is the resurrection of the dead. Okay, a lot of people wanna understand, and then in the last uh, couple, three days, our sister Faye from, uh, I believe she's from Jamaica, she, was also asking me some questions about it. So the timing was perfect. And because some of the questions she asked, I went and probed a little bit further into this question, into that question, and was able to add some more pieces to the puzzle. And so we're, we're gonna get the understanding. You guys are gonna see that, um, or, or not that, but where the resurrection of the dead is. You know, we talked about it so many times that, that so much confusion comes from the whole world having been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. That's where it all comes from. Um, when everybody's foundation is the Gospel of Matthew, because they don't know who the Gospels are speaking to, it, it, when you know what the truth is, everything opens up. It just, it changes the whole ballgame. All of Scripture becomes exciting, more than it was before. I'm not saying you maybe weren't excited studying Scripture. But I could tell you this, you most certainly were confused in hundreds of more places than where many of us in this ministry are now. Because once you begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, it's, it, it's supernatural what happens. And you become excited and you want to dig and dig and dig. And that's the kind of stuff that, that we reveal and that we share here in this ministry in, in helping to understand these mysteries. Um, so we're gonna really get into that today. Um, we're, that's gonna be the bulk of the, of the video. I'm gonna share a couple things uh, early on, just little reminders and, and things that, that you know, I, I can't help but be excited. Looking at the season and time that we're in, understanding the 70th year that this is right now, and, and how we were under, able to understand it with the additional four years and, and counting from when they also had a government and that, you know, how about the mystery that the Lord revealed to us with Taurus? That Taurus is the beginning. Is there anybody else on earth? I'm, I'm serious, is there anybody else on earth that understands that the beginning is Taurus, that, that it's the Feast of Weeks because the beginning was always Taurus? That just blows my mind. And it's connected to the one thing in the physical that we know the Spirit gave us for the Word. All right? It's just awesome. So we're going to go into that. We're going to touch on some of these things and, um, and, and do what we do. All right? Sorry, I, I seem like I'm maybe a little bit off and a little bit of a stutter because I, I'm using the same program to record videos as I always have, but they've done an upgrade. And so I've got this, brr, this thing sitting up in the corner of my screen. You guys can't see it. And it's all for highlighting and, and zooming and doing all this stuff. And it's bothering me. <laughs> I haven't figured out how to remove it. So eventually as I get going, it's okay. All will be good. And then I'm also starting late tonight for a good reason. Um, just in, related to our, in relation to our house. Um, as you guys know, those of you guys who have been around for a bit, you know, we thought we had to move out of this house. The owner put it for sale and it turned out not quite a year ago yet, right? About three quarters of a year ago. Um, the new owners took it over 
and they put in the agreement they saw how we cared for the house as if it was our own you know it's it's a it's in clean and it's in order and we keep it nice and we live well and um their deal was because they work in saudi arabia and they won't be back for five years their deal for the agreement was that if they're going to buy the house we had to stay as tenants or they weren't going to sign on the dotted line <laughs> <laughs> so we were very, very blessed with that, right? Very blessed. And um, they were getting stuff done to the house. So this week, uh, the guys were here replacing the roof. And they just finished like, oh, maybe about 20 minutes ago. They finished cleaning up and they had the big, you know, the big like leaf blower thing to clean up and everything else. So that also made it a little bit late. So it's later than I wanted, but for good reason. And then I have a little bit of a distraction from this upgrade to a uh, screencast matic that I use. But anyways, it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. And you're going to see connections, words given to us in the scriptures, clearly showing when the resurrection of the dead will be. Now, we're going to understand that it's clearly one group. There's a connection to another group. But then there also seems like there's something else going on. It's it's really quite wild. So we're going to get into that. We're going to go into all the parts and pieces that I can bring up that I thought on, that I was searching and, and new connections and see where it all ties into. All right. And that's where we're going to go. But before I get started, as you guys all know, for anybody that's new, you're going to hear things like 14 years of tribulation. You're going to hear things like I said a moment ago, who the Gospels are speaking to. When you hear these things and you start scratching your head, you want to come to this playlist li link right here and the one called the Revealed End Times Study Notes Series. Click on here. And when, you'll do, when you do, you'll come to this grouping of 11 videos, this playlist. These first three videos are the absolute key to help you understand. If you've ever wondered why there are so many apparent discrepancies within the Gospels, you will have heard things like people tell you, oh, it's just different perspectives. Oh, they just add a, a, a different point of view. But clearly it's not always the case. You're going to see as we talk about this stuff in relation to the end of days, and we're going we're gonna to tie in the, the story of Jonah into tonight's video and the difference of it within the Gospels, you're going to clearly see why there's been such a debate over the centuries on what's going on with the Gospels, because the wording in Jonah is not a perspective. You can't say he told them nothing and got in a ship and left, but told the other ones it would be as Jonah was, and which was the 40-day warning, and as Jonah was three days and three nights. I mean, there, there has to be something else going on, right? Well, that's what you're going to come to understand right here. You're going to see in Luke's Gospel that Jesus, before going to the cross, was arrayed in a gorgeous white robe. It, it's called gorgeous. It means white, radiant, beautiful. You're going to go into Mark and see that it says purple. You're going to go into Matthew and see that it says scarlet. Well, these guys weren't colorblind. There was reason. There was, uh, there was prophetic implications to why these things were said. That's what you're going to begin to understand in this first intro to the Gospels, the end time Gospels, which we call who the Gospels are speaking to. You can come into the description box below the video and spend 30 minutes in that Bible study. You can print it off. You can read it along. You can make notes in it. And I would recommend also going to ministryrevealed.com. And there you can download the book on PDF for free in five different languages. You can listen to the audio or you can read the book from the website. Or you can go to Amazon, buy the paperback or the uh, ebook, and go into chapter one, which will go into greater detail of this introduction of who the Gospels are speaking to. It's going to blow your mind. You're going to get so excited. You're going to dig into Scripture more than you ever have before. I promise you, it's that. It's that. Wow. It's the mystery revealed for the time of the end. And I used to say this, and I still say it sometimes. I, it used to bother me for a long time. It's been going on now for about five and a half years, but it really bothered me at the beginning because I would freak out so much. All I wanted to do was reach as many people as possible. Do you know how many people wanted to listen? <laughs> Zero. 
absolutely none. Nobody wanted to listen. Everybody thought it was crazy. So the best option was, of course, just doing videos and letting the spirit lead the people, right? And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, I, I, you just want to reach everybody you can. But what happens is as you really get a depth of understanding in it, you realize it was a purposeful mystery for the end of days. You'll understand that as you go further and further into it. Because what you realize is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are the synoptic gospels, in the end of days, it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. Luke is to the bride of Christ. Mark is to the sleeping church or the world, right? The Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel. And Matthew is written to Judah. It's called the spirit, the light, and the flesh. It, it, it'll blow your mind. But when you realize it, you realize it's also God's harvest model. You realize there's a first fruit, there's a main harvest, and there's corners and gleaning. If this had been known for hundreds of years and went out all over the earth, nobody would have been studying from Matthew. We would have all been in Luke. Why would you even want to go to Mark? Why would you even want to spend most of your time in Mark? Wait for mid-trib rapture. You see, pre-trib is Luke. Mid-trib is Mark. Post-trib is Matthew. All three of them are true. It's mind-blowing once you come to understand it. And you're going to hear in the second piece, which is 14 years, you're going to realize that the Luke group goes pre-trib, bride of Christ, <clears throat> that first fruits portion that are in Christ, spirit-filled. The Mark group, which is those who are maybe claiming Christ, but they're asleep, they're not ready, they're not watching. They don't spend much time with them, but they believe in them and so forth. That is called the sleeping church. That's the, the great multitude, the, the main harvest. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen three and a half years into seals. It's going to happen in the seventh year of seals. That's how important this first video is, <clears throat> because you'll understand why there are three discourses. Because there are three different portions of time. It's going to blow your mind. And then not only is it seven years of seals, but then there's seven years of trumpets. And you're going to come to understand in the third video that all of this has been confused over the hundreds and hundreds of years because we've all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. When your foundation is Matthew, which is to the Jews, all of your perspective of everything else that looks like pre-trib you think is pre-trib when really it's mid-trib. It's, it's crazy. But you come and watch this big, uh, almost three-hour video of it's all because of Matthew. And I tell you, it's going to blow your mind. You're going to understand that pre, mid, and post, they're all true. You're going to see the revealed end times seven churches, how it's going to play out and how their wording relate to the 14 years and the different portions of time. Tonight, you're going to hear a little bit of a talk about comma and something so simple as now I wrote the word comma, but it just means the, the, the comma and the word and that follows it. You're going to see its importance tonight in part of the video. And then, of course, once you really get a grasp on who the Gospels are speaking to and understand these differences in the discourses, <clears throat> this is going to blow you away. You're going to see the discourses are Luke, Mark, Matthew for the end of days. I promise you, it'll be worth every moment you take to study these things out and see for yourselves that they be true. It's so awesome. Let me share with you guys. I want to share this with you real quick. Sorry, sip of coffee. This is uh, a new brother in Christ, uh, new no to us. Gadgets are <coughs> Excuse me. Not that guy. <laughs> Check this out. I thought this was exciting, but sad. All right. But but still exciting because it's amazing that family goes to this length in what it does to people. And I was I responded to this brother as well. This was from the last video. And um, I, I gave him a response and so forth as well. But we know this also happened to our brother, Jimmy. And I believe it happened to one or two others. Uh, in the ministry from people that had sent me info over the last few years. Listen 
to what he says because again it's exciting this is this is why i do what i do okay because i know there are people out there like each of us were before that knew there was something going on that there were these mysteries in the gospels that that something was going to be revealed to to help people understand the end of time the end of days okay listen to what he says this is from alex alan i would just like to say that your videos saved me this week i have dove deep into the words you are speaking and the evidence you are providing after many hours of diligent searching and study guided by the holy spirit i sounded the trumpets to my family and my wife's family that we are nearing the end times we must repent and be saved this scared them they thought i was manic because my faith so greatly changed over a single weekend we are three days out from then, meaning <clears throat> three days from when the weekend had passed because he sent this to me two, three days ago. All right. So from when he watched. Um, <clears throat> so uh, da, 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 where, three, where am I? So greatly changed. So we're so far three days. Sorry, why did I lose my chat? Thought I was manic. <laughs> Come on. It's like I'm going blind here all of a sudden. Fate so greatly played. Uh, okay, yeah. We are three days out from then, and they have already brought me to see a counselor and are pursuing me to see a psychiatrist. Sound familiar? We've talked about this with a couple, two or three others, right? So far, they have found nothing wrong, but rather that I have had a change of faith. I am willingly going, as I know Satan is doing everything in his power to deceive God's people. I want to be an example of God's light to them in these times we will be persecuted and called crazy in these times but if there's a chance to save more brothers and sisters for me this is worth it the holy spirit brought me to your channel and i thank god he did i want you to be aware of how many lives you are saving in these times as a chain reaction from the people who are educating themselves on the prophecies being fulfilled i'll see you soon brother i love it I love it. This is 100% why I do what I do. We will see you soon, brother. Be strong. You're understanding. You've got it. It is the spirit who led you. And know that you're not alone. We have had others here in this ministry that family did the same thing to. And they all had a clean bill of health. You could not convince them one iota that what they have understood has been revealed and they could prove it without me anymore. You see, you can go to the scriptures. You were diligently seeking yourself and proved it for your own self that these words are true. These revelations are true. I love it. Blessings, brother, to you and your family. All right. Now let's, oh, another commercial. I thought I would share this one again too. It's only, I think it's only like a minute and a half or something for the portion that I want to share. Because I believe that, you know, with these Dana Coverstone dreams, I believe there is something to them. And, and when you hear this dream of his, we've talked about it in the past, but I want to reiterate it because of this season and time we're in. You know the other dream that, that started this all for him? Excuse me, I think it was in June. Oh, I don't remember what year anymore. 2020, I think. Yeah, I think it was 2020. And what had happened is the things and the events that he talks about. Remember, he says that the schools didn't, they, they were full of cobwebs, right? That DC was on fire in different places. And there were Russian and Chinese military, right? Uh, as UN uh, people were all over places in the US. And he was talking about it being September, October, and so forth. You see, we used to look at that as many people did and expected it back in the time when it happened. For us, we thought it was also because it was 70 years. And then, you know, we would look at it the next year as many other people. Then we would look at it in 2022 as many people also did. But then he had this one, right? When was this one? From nine months ago? Then he had this one. I believe this one proceeds. I, I'm positive. It precedes the one 
with Chinese and Russian military and, and the, the cobwebs and the schools and all that stuff? Because I believe this one is the beginning. So I'm going to share it again just to, to, to encourage you guys and to remind you guys, this is the season we're looking at, right? The beginning, beginning. The beginning of the 50 to the beginning of the 14 years. We'll touch on that again in a bit as well. Listen to what he says. If you can hear it, you can always go to his video here and listen to the time frame. But just listen to what he says. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for hanging out with us for an hour or so. Uh, I want to thank my good friend Sheree Gaw for being a part of this with me and praying over the dreams. As you know, when I have the dream, I send to her as well. I pray, she prays. I've got some, some men in my church that pray for me, other folks that are praying. Uh, we, we don't do this. Uh, we're not asking for offerings. Or money. We don't, I, I, we're sharing these dreams because I believe God's trying to wake the church up. And I'm going to be very, very upfront with this one. This one has been one of the heaviest dreams that I've ever had in the last two years. You know, it was two years ago this month, June 24th of 2020, that I shared the first dream. And uh, it doesn't seem like it's, it's been that long. Things have, have happened. Things have gone on. But uh, what, what I want to say is this. This one's heavy. This has been heavy on my heart. And it's been heavy on Cherie's heart. Um, and the reason we share the dreams are to wake people up. If you saw my From the Perch yesterday, uh, you know that it was like a prelude one I'm going to share today. I, if you have not, I don't, I don't say, hey, go watch this. Hey, share this. I really encourage you to watch the From the Perch yesterday. I talked about narcissism, both in the world and the church. It was in the book of Habakkuk. And in the, back, in the book of Habakkuk, God really basically says to Habakkuk, the righteous will live by faith. And I believe that we're in that time frame right here, right now. Uh, and you'll see from what the man spoke to me, I believe, which, which is Jesus and the Holy Spirit, uh, that there's not a whole lot of time left before he comes and not a whole lot of time left to work. So I'm calling this the millstone dream. You'll find out why. I'm going to go ahead and share it. I'll stop a few times and make a couple comments about what I was seeing. And then let's read the interpretation. Um, I dreamt that I was standing in an open field and looking west in broad daylight and the sun at high noon. And there was a compass in my right palm that was facing at the point of west. And that's how I knew what direction I was facing. And there was a silver colored straight metal rod or staff in my left hand. It was touching the ground and it went at least a foot above my head. I'm about five, six and a half. So it was up to about almost about seven, you know, six and a half feet, seven feet tall in my left hand. So on my right hand, I got the compass looking up pointing west and the staff that's in my left hand. I was watching what appeared to be a large stone in the middle of the air. It seemed to be at a very high altitude and it seemed bigger than it should. It was like looking at the moon when it's way too close to the earth or, or it seems really, really big. But this stone was huge and out of place, did not look like it belonged there. And it was almost like a square. And there was a large round hole drilled near the top of it. This thing was thick. It was miles and my, probably hundreds of miles wide. Uh, in my mind, I thought maybe I'm seeing the, uh, the, the walls of the city uh, mentioned in the New Jerusalem and in, in, in Revelation. But it was huge. It had the large hole drilled through it. And what appeared to be a streamer, it looked like a streamer like you see a tail on a kite or something like that. Tied, it was tied through the stone. It was very blurry. I began walking uh, west through a very, very vast, empty field that seemed as if a combine had just gone through. So everything had been harvested. I was seeing the, uh, I'm, from, I'm a hoosier, I'm from Indiana. So after the combines would go through, you'd see those bottom stalks of corn about maybe up eight, eight inches to a foot tall where they'd been harvested. It looked like that. Uh, the grass. Okay, so remember that. There, there's already a place harvested like the combines had gone through. So there's already a, a harvest that had taken place. But we don't know what size of harvest yet, if it was everything, if it was just a portion. <clears throat> but what did he see first? He sees the stone's throw, okay? So remember the sequence. He sees the stone, he's in the field, combine had come through, so it's like we're going to see the stone before it hits, but then the pre-trib harvest. Listen to the rest of it. In most places, the green and healthy, but where it had been cut, it was browning, and it started to look dead. And the stone suddenly began to descend, but did not have a fiery entry. Like if you see a, when the space shuttle came, when rockets came in, you see that fiery entry. There was no fire on this at all. There was no wave disruptions in the sky, so to speak. Nor was there any sound. So no fire in the atmosphere, no entry point. There was no uh, sound except the whipping of what appeared to be now a rope. I can see now this was a huge rope, uh, probably hundreds of feet wide, that had gone through this, this big stone. Um, it made a sound like plastic that was not secured around cargo and a truck going down the highway. There was a Tyson chicken factory about 12 miles from where I live. And so every day I see trucks go by full of chickens with a plastic wrap. And when they're going fast, you hear that plastic. That's what it sounded like. And now the stone was falling very quickly. And I could actually feel wind coming off of it. Uh, and then you began to realize that it was like that whoosh sound coming. And it was then that I realized I was as far west as I could be. I was literally standing in California looking off of the shore into the shoreline of the Pacific Ocean. And I saw a sign that said Pacific Ocean. So that's how I knew where I was. I then realized that the stone seemed to be about the size of Texas, and it was shadowing over the entire western half of the United States. As it fell, I could hear the whipping of the rope behind it, and I could also see it was trailing all the way back to the line of the black outer space way up in the sky. And the rope appeared to be miles and miles wide. It was impossible to tell how wide it was. Then this stone hit in the middle of the ocean, but there was no violent tsunami-like blast. There was no, no, nothing crazy. It, it hit as hard as it could, but it just began to sink, wobble kind of slowly into the water, and then it began to sink. Now, at this point, the broad daylight that I was seeing faded over the next few minutes of the dream, and I saw the rope falling from the sky. 
and it formed like a circle around the United States of America. Mexico and Canada were not in the mix of what I saw. I saw the rope as the stones going down. There's still rope coming out of the ocean, still rope in the sky, and it makes its way like a circle around America. And as the stones sank, the rope tightened around the shores of the country until the Midwest appeared to be having a choking face and was having trouble breathing. It was like I saw a face going <gasps> like, like, like I couldn't breathe. There were no arms or hands. I just saw a face restricted trying to, trying to breathe. And I could hear a heartbeat. This was a very, very loud heartbeat that was, it was not steady. It was choppy. It was violent. It wasn't, there was definitely some type of arrhythmia going on. And then I heard the millstone hit the bottom of the ocean. I could hear it. It was like a sonar uh, dull thud, but I knew it hit the bottom of the ocean. And at that point, the Midwest took a deep breath. That face that I saw took a deep breath as the noose around the nation loosened slightly. There was a smile and a look of relief on that face in the Midwest. Then I saw the man's face that I see so often. It was superimposed over, it suddenly went from the, just a, a face of, of someone, like, just a face that was having trouble breathing, to the face of the man. He took a deep breath and then he spoke these words. This is for the slaughter of and the hands that shed innocent blood. I then saw the stone sitting on the ocean floor and I saw this hand, this big, huge hand that rushed down through the water, grabbed that stone, which I'm, I'm going to call a millstone, and it pushed that rock through the mantle violently. As I said before, I believe that's now Psalms 18, right? So you see it coming. The first fruits harvest portion is gone. This now gets pushed into the mantle and the Psalms 18 has begun. That rope tightened real quickly around the nation's throat. I saw violent earthquakes. I saw uh, smoke rolling up as that last breath was taken. I saw the eyes kind of get bigger. You could tell this thing was being choked. But what got my attention was the speed in which the nation seemed to die. I watched it. This violent hand pushes that, that, that rock through the mantle and it just, like a, like a zip line, just real quick, just, and that was it. Then I saw a horse, a white horse and a rider on it dressed in gleaming white, and it was the man. He pointed. And a white horse, man on a white horse coming. Isn't that what comes at the, at the eighth day? So this is taking place during the seven days after the pre-trib escape. And then he sees the man on the white horse, right? When's that? After the wedding in heaven, bang, on the eighth day, while Psalms 18 had been taking place. Man, it lines up. With his right hand to the destruction, and he said, I keep my word, and I will be faithful to keep my word as it regards the blessing and the curse. There is not much time to work, and those that know, know this deeply. Get busy, stay busy, and know that I'm coming back very soon. And the horse and rider were gone in a flash, and I was standing back in that field where I started, right there in the middle of the, of the, of the, of the nation. I noticed that the season had changed, and the crops were now ready, and the fields were absolutely ripe. Uh, but only a few people were in the field working. I was overcome with emotion and despair because I could realize there's not enough people to do what needs to be done. And then I saw large groups of people coming from every direction, north, south. Man, you see that? Now it's going. The end of the 40 days, son of man is gone. The fields are all there. They're ripe. They're ready. People are ready to receive the word, come to Christ, realizing what's begun. I love it. It was longer than I expected. I, for, I don't know why I thought it was like a minute and 40 or something. But I wanted to share that just to give you guys a reminder. I believe this is exactly the, the pre-trib and the events of the escape, the stones throw, the Psalms 18 week that takes place, the, the Lord returning uh, on the eighth day as the Son of Man, the white horse rider, the the events of, of the of the first fruit remnant bride workers that aren't enough workers that are going to need more help to bring in the harvest every single one of these things we spoke in order and it was only a portion of the field that had only been harvested at the beginning because why it's just as i told you guys at the beginning for anybody that's new luke is the pre-trib they are the first fruits of the harvest Mark is the great multitude, the, the main harvest. And Matthew is the corners and gleaning. Now they all have different typologies with, within the imagery in scripture, whether it's weed and grapes, right? Wheat and fruit and so forth. But in the big picture, there's a first fruits, a main harvest and a corners and gleaning. That's the pre, the mid and the post. All right, awesome stuff. So I thought I would share that with you. Now, you know what? I, I wanted to also add this into the mix because it's something obviously we've been recently talking about uh, in, in the videos just a little bit earlier, right? Two, three videos back. And that is this awesome connection that we found. You see, not going into all the details of these things, but just this. You see, when you know what we've come to understand about 
what John is talking about here, that in the beginning was the word, right? It was the spirit portion. Then the word became light, right? Jesus be was made light. And then after the light, Jesus is made flesh. Interesting, right? Verse one and two. Verse three, all things were by him. And then you see, then he's made light. And then look what happens. In the seventh verse, he was the light, Jesus being the light. And then look what happens. In the 14th verse, it's flesh. You think it's by chance? Do you think that's by chance? It's the beginning group, the light group in seven, and the flesh group in four, 14, I mean. Brothers and sisters, that's called pre, mid, and post. Spirit, light, flesh. Luke, Mark, Matthew. It's amazing. You see, but... In relation to our, the, in the beginning, this is what's so awesome because we know it's connected to Genesis 1. Okay, we've talked on it many times. But the recent connection of Genesis 1 and verse 2 is that this word in the beginning is a dual beginning because it was Taurus back in the beginning when creation started. It started in Taurus. We know what? We know that the sun has gone off by two months, but the Lord God has never changed because his constellations never change. So to the Lord God, it's still the beginning. It'll be in Taurus. Well, that beginning is the beginning of the 14 years. But this beginning is also, as we know, Jesus being the first of the first fruits. This is the feast of first fruits, Hebrew word 72, 25. So we know that in the beginning of creation, it was the time of the Feast of First Fruits. So what does that mean? Well, there's a dual beginning. It was Taurus and it was Christ as the beginning being the first fruits, as the Feast of First Fruits. So it's a duality, right? There, there's a dual meaning of in the beginning. And this is what we revealed. And, and we shared this even in a recent video. It just so happens that john has two verses that then goes on in the third to say that everything was made by christ through christ which is what genesis 1 1 is all about and then what then it goes on to talk about the light and the darkness which is verse 3 and 4 and so forth going into genesis chapter 1. but what do we know about the beginning of genesis 1. there's a beginning and there's a beginning and John just so happens to be talking about two beginnings in two verses. Beginning and beginning. Because one is like the beginning, that's Christ. You see, in the beginning was the word. Well, who's the word and who's the beginning? Christ was. See, the same was in the beginning with God. Do you catch the wording? Who is this beginning? In the beginning was the word. Who was the beginning that is the word? Christ. Christ, right? He is the feast of first fruits. It's Jesus, the first of the first fruits. The next word for beginning is the same was in the beginning with God. What beginning is that? God's beginning, which is Taurus. You see, you realize in this that when we've shared on these things recently, and even over the last like year or so, I want to remind you guys that see Shavuot, it has to be, it has to be in Taurus. Well, what did we talk about? What have we shared on this in relation to Taurus, guys? The sun is two months off. The whole world knows it. Anybody that studies uh, uh, and uh, does the sun, moon, and stars and does this for work and, and astronomy, and scientists that search it, everybody knows. The Jews know it. It's in papers everywhere that the sun is sped up and it's two months off. Well, what have we talked about recently with the moon? We've been trying to say, well, with the moon, okay, if this is the going to be the beginning, okay, the Hebrew calendar is in the right place this year. And guess what? Maybe it's off by a day or whatever, right? But we're saying based on the Hebrew calendar, okay, there it is. And we know that 50 days earlier is the Feast of First Fruits. But you know what's interesting? Two months is about 60 days, correct? 
two months off is about 60 days. But we know from the revelation of the end of days that the portion that's called above 14 years that Paul tells us is 50 days. You see, maybe as soon as I say it, you guys are going to be like, oh. Because you see, if we've understood the sun and we know that the sun is off by two months, why isn't it off by 60 days? Why is it only off 50? You could say, well, the Lord God knew, and that's why the revelation at the end of days was Luke's discourse, that whole 50-day period, the escape, and then the events that happen. Okay. That, that, that's one way to look at it, but it has to be something based in understanding, right? There has to be something to be able to show what the difference of 10 days is, right? Because if the sun is off by two months, and that's about 60 days, but all we're doing is going back by 50 days. Remember what I said about the moon? And I was saying, well, if the moon is off, you know, maybe do we have to go, what was it, uh, 15 or 16 days further? And then we get down here and we come into June and it may, all, it may actually go to the solstice. But then in the recent video, what I was sharing was that I believe the Lord God has already accounted for it. This is already the sun being off course and the moon being off course every year have already been accounted for in the prophetic timeline. How do we know? Well, because it goes from Feast of Weeks from Taurus and it goes back 50 days. So what is this? This is the beginning first fruits, which is Christ. And this is the beginning of the 14 years of the Lord God starting the 14 years of tribulation. In the beginning, the beginning, right? That's why I was sharing that with John and why it's so exciting that he had those two beginnings right there in his first two verses. Because one relates to the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation in Taurus. The other one relates to the beginning as being Christ, the first fruits. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. But the count is only 50 and not 60. Well, isn't that fascinating? because we have it from the book of jubilees and there will be those that that there will be those who will make observations of the moon for this one the moon corrupts the stated times and comes out early each year by 10 days huh huh if it's 2 months off that's about 60 days but we're only looking at 50 days before the 14 years, and it's precisely 10 days earlier, or, or 10 days later, I should say. To me, it's another pointer, another little confirmation showing that the two months off and the 10 days for the moon are accounted for. Why? Because Nissan is where it's supposed to be this year. So if that's the beginning of months, but it comes out 10 days difference, well, there's 10 days out of the two months early that the sun comes up and the 10 days for the moon difference from those 60 for the sun, at least 50 days. Add that to everything that we've talked about in relation to the original 14thers and that Polycarp who had learnt from the apostle John knew that at a beeb and the first full moon that was true passover regardless of which day of the week right why would you stand up and be persecuted if it was off even though the the, the moon was off and the sun was off at the time this is the only date beginning to beginning that accounts for the moon and for the sun it's awesome. There's so many exciting things like this, guys. Let me see. I was going to go. I think maybe I'll save Colossians because it, it's uh, it, it's awesome. Come into uh, Colossians chapter one and you see everything in here. You're going to see so much stuff in relation to what? To the Mark group. OK, it's all about the the left behind group the world the sleeping church some will leave some will come in and wake up during this time it's it's awesome 
But I'm going to say that because it's kind of uh, it kind of goes off in a in a bit of a different direction than where I wanted to keep going with this tonight. Let me show you something else. So I'll save that for another one. Check this out. This was uh, somebody had shared this. I think it was in the form or somebody sent me a private message. And we know this right with the word winter. Check this out. This is another reason. So why am I sharing this? To remind you of the season and time that we are in. Okay. If the escape is connected to the feast of first fruits, and that's the pre-trib, we have, of course, that seven days to the eighth day. Then you have it within the count to the 50. And then what? The 14 years begins. Okay, summer is near at hand and the tribulation has started. So what would be about two and a half years that we know is the tri first two and a half years of seals, which is World War III? Okay, we know it's World War III. It'll start with the attack on Jerusalem somewhere around here, right at the end of the 50 days. And then what's going to happen? World War, War III will break out. You see this again, broken record when it comes to second edges, but how many times have we shared this, right? The most high will deliver those who are on the earth. This is the Luke group pre-trip. Bewilderment of mind shall come on those who dwell on the earth and they'll plan to make war against each other, nation against nation, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. Pre-trip, they're gonna plan to make war against each other and then they do, which is World War III. Okay, we know this stuff. But when does it all happen? World War III is breaking out late spring to the beginning of summer. So what would be about two and a half years later? Winter. Winter, right? So if anybody that's new and you heard me talking there in the beginning about the discourses and watching that video on the discourses and understanding who the discourses are speaking to and when that it goes Luke, then Mark, then Matthew, you're going to realize that the abomination of desolations it, in, Luke, in, in Mark's discourse, it's about approximately two and a half years into seals. And then Antichrist will get his power to continue for the next 42 months to the end of the sixth year of seals. So it's, it's approximate, right? We know he gets his 42 months and it's right in that time frame. Well, what does Mark's discourse tell us about that time of the abomination of the desolation when Antichrist gets that power to continue 42 months? Okay, you have the abomination of desolation. What does it say? Mark 13, verse 18. And pray ye that your flight be not in winter. So this is going to be the point when it's going to be worse at this point than any other point in human history up to this day. Do you know that this is a little over two and a half years from now? Do you know that that means World War III, that's about two and a half years starting late spring, summer this year, that those two and a half years of World War III are called the beginning of sorrows? What would be about two and a half years later? Praying that your flight isn't in winter? You see, Luke's discourse doesn't say that. Mark's discourse does, and Luke's discourse does. Check this out. Do you know it only says it one other time? See, it's not even used in Luke at all. And in John, it's only used one time. This word winter is in John chapter 10 verse 22. And somebody that's new might say, well, what does that matter? Well, you're going to come to understand at least a little bit here in part, as we go through this tonight, that we have something called chapters to years. Okay. There's a video in the intro series about it as well. It's going to sound so out there that you're going to say, no, it's not possible. But I assure you, every one of these chapters correlate to events in the end time years it'll absolutely blow your mind Zechariah has 14 chapters Hosea has 14 chapters Hosea is what Paul told us 
to the Gentiles, right? To the house of Israel, right? The Gentiles grafted in. Who is Zechariah to? Zechariah is to the Jews. They both have 14 chapters. They are both end time prophetic books, right? They were prophets. They would say minor prophets. The Gospel of John has 21 chapters. Genesis, first 21 chapters, has the same typology of events with, within the imagery of Melchizedek showing up, within the imagery of, of the story of the Ark from chapter 7 to 8, which is where we are right now. All of the, it's all paralleled all throughout. It'll, it'll absolutely blow your mind. Well, you're going to see this and why I'm bringing it up is because we're going to touch at one point towards the end in John chapter 21 and prove out another point that when we look at John's gospel here in this ministry, we're always looking from this perspective of end time eyes. Okay, we call it end time eyes. It's, it's this ability to see who the gospels are speaking to and understanding why certain things are said in some gospels and not in others and why some things are said differently, which people think are contradictions in some gospels compared to the others. All right. Well, John's is one that stands on his own in the gospels. And he has 21 chapters that relate to the last three sevens on earth. Seven years, which are the easy years right now, like Jacob, they flew by like days. We're only waiting for the last 50 of it. Then it's seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. And chapter 21 relates to the end of the 13th year of tribulation or the end of the sixth year of trumpets and the start of the seventh year of trumpet or the 14th year. You're going to see when we get there. But why am I bringing this up right now with John? Because this is a fun one. You see, the first year of seals is connected to John chapter 8. The second year of seals, chapter 9. The third year of seals. What does that mean? Well, we, we talked about this many times. If you're, if, if you're uh, uh, born, somebody's born, and when they turn one, we call them one year old, but really they're in their second year. Hello. Right? So I would say they're one and a half or they're a year and 10 months. Well, those 10 months are part of the second year. And when the child turns two, it has already completed two years. Okay? That's very important. It sounds simple, but it's very important to track and to understand. So what do we have? Year one starts right here on this line between seven and eight. Okay? This is year one starting. This is year one ending and year two starting. This is year two ending and year three starting between two and three. So if first year is done, second year is done, what's in the third year? That means it's, it's an event that's going to take place some point during the third year. Well, what did I just explain in relation to how the first two and a half years, approximately the first two and a half years play out? The first two and a half years are World War III. Okay? They're World War III. They're, the, they're called the beginnings of sorrows. So if we go to Mark's discourse as we did, and we saw where winter was, which is the time when the abomination, the mark of the beast comes, and it's the time to flee into the wilderness, we know that that's in the third year, about six months into the year. So look at what we see when we read about John chapter 10, which would be in the third year. When you're reading these things and you're correlating them to chapters to years, the one thing you, it's more difficult to understand is that sometimes that the, the events or the words spoke about in the chapter could be something early on in the year. It could be something that plays out around the midst of the year. It could be something that plays out towards the end of the year. Or it could literally be something discussed that's taking the, the entire year that's playing out. Okay? So in this one, in John chapter 10, which would be in the third year, and here we are talking about winter, which will happen about two and a half years into the tribulation of seals, we go to John chapter 10, and it just so happens that John chapter 10 
Verse 22 is the only other place in the Gospels where it says winter? Do you think that's by, do you think that's just by chance? This is awesome. See, look at this. If we go back, listen to what the conversation is. Jesus is warning that any other that comes into the sheepfold that doesn't come in through the door but comes in some other way is a robber and a thief. Well, we know that this chapter to year represents the time of the Antichrist coming in. Okay? And a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. See, those in Christ are going to flee. Those that come to Christ, those that have committed the, the greatest uh, um, uh, 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 um, revival in human history that will take place during the time of seals. See, the thief comes to what? He comes not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. Verse 12, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. This is all about a typology of the Antichrist coming. Does it have applications throughout our daily life? Yes. But this is an end time revelation ministry. It's pre, mid, post. It's Luke, Mark, Matthew. It's spirit, light, flesh. It's seven easy years, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. And John's gospel is an absolute revelation reflection of exactly that. This is a typology of Antichrist coming. And when Antichrist comes and the fleeing takes place, there's the word winter. Do you think it's by chance? Come on. It's so exciting when you understand these things. You see, we're going to be talking about another word coming soon. You see, this one is used 639 times. But you're going to see this other one that we're going to talk about that has nothing to do with this word coming and where it's found is precisely related to the final year of trumpets it's connected to the resurrection of the dead it's connected to the lord coming feet down it's connected to daniel it's all over the place it's just awesome so this was this was like uh, a, a, a light leading in for new people to, to understand this whole chapters to years things going on. You see, in John chapter 14, which is the time of the, of the rapture of the great multitude, when they're going to paradise, first group goes to the third heaven, second group goes to paradise, and the Lord returns feet down. Escape, rapture, return is what we call it. And in John chapter 14, he says, remember, I told you that I go to prepare a place that where I go, I will return. And what? He's going to gather them to where he is, that where they are, uh, that where he is, there they may be also. And they'll always be with them. Pretty wild, right? And it's in chapter 14. So this one was really interesting because the reason it's interesting is because of the timing of the pre-trib escape you see it was something that even when we were talking about this time of year last year in 2022 and we were looking at you know uh, uh this hanukkah connection and this timing why why were we looking at the beginning of hanukkah because there was a 50-day connect see told you <laughs> i just had another glitch trying to go and move something in my cursor hit whatever button was there anyways so what had happened last year is in 2022, I know I'm showing you 2023, but in 2022, one of the reasons we were looking at the time of Hanukkah is because there was this 50-day count to the New Year of Trees, you see? But now in 2023, when we make this account for knowing that everything is two months off to the Lord God, and then we've got 50 days before, we know that that would make Nisan 15th to the Lord God actually the new year of trees it's pretty wild right but 
the reason I'm bringing this up is because if Mark and Matthew both tell us winter, and we know that in the third year, and even John is confirming it in the chapters to years, that when the wolf, the Antichrist comes, pray that it be not winter when you have to flee, when he scatters the sheep. Why on earth, or how on earth, knowing what we know, could we think that the pre-trib would have been in winter? You see? So what about Matthew's discourse? Matthew's discourse tells them winter as well. Well, guess what happens? Three and a half years. So the eighth year, nine, ten, in the eleventh year, which is a total of ten and a half, but it's three and a half years into trumpets. What does Matthew say? Pray that your flight be not in winter. So three and a half years from Taurus or Savan, right, which is near summertime, would be about winter coming in to begin. So what would it be if it starts here in Taurus? What would it be ten and a half years later? Winter would be near at hand too. Just as it was with Luke. Uh, sorry, just as it was with Mark's group, with Mark's discourse. Why? Because the Lord is here on heavenly Mount Zion the first three and a half years. Remember, until Satan's cast down, the battle in heaven is lost. The Messiah, right? The Lord is cut off. The fleeing takes place into the wilderness. That happens in the 11th year, which is 10 and a half years in to tribulation. So if it starts at Taurus, ends at Taurus, starts at Taurus, ends at Taurus, then if this is starting in Taurus, which is Savan, one, two, three and a half, bam, it's winter. So the reason I'm sharing this is to again remind you guys, it can't be later in the year. Do you follow? We can't be going to all the way to tabernacles time. What do we know about tabernacles? Well, some people would say, well, most people don't know the, the, the 50 days that come first. But if you were to say, I don't know, trumpets or tabernacles, and you know how long six months is, which would bring you to 2024, right? At the time of spring, why would you be worrying about fleeing in the winter? Why would the sheep be scattered and it would be the time of winter? And John even said it was the Feast of Dedication. Hello. John chapter 10 said it was the Feast of Dedication and it was winter. This is exciting for us, guys. We're only what? One, two, three weeks away? It's not a thus saith the Lord. It's revelation through prophetic revelation, revelation, revelation in all the mysteries that we've been revealed. This is exciting, exciting stuff. This is proving to us the timing, guys. This proves it. Winter is for Mark and Matthew. Awesome. Su such an awesome, awesome connection. All right, now watch this. Now let's get into, see it's minus four. It's still a little chilly in the garage. Had to move the heat back because it's getting too warm. All right, let's go into 1 Corinthians 15. And many of you that have been around at least for a while will know about this resurrection of the dead. We've spoken on it a number of times in, in, um, in years past, right? But... There are a number of people, as I said, that have been asking about it. One, because I probably mentioned I was going to be sharing it again and delving into it. Um, but then, of course, there was Faye and there were others that were asking as well. So th I thought this would be a great time to really go into. We got some really good details. See, we got all of these tabs up here opened up. So let's start right here. Let's start in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 20. And you're going to see later how it brings us back up to the beginning that we've shared on a number of times. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. 
For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Listen to this. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. They that are Christ's at his coming? What would that be there for, right? Let's go have a look. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Look at this word. Actually, let me show it to you here. This program here, this is a blue letter Bible. Anybody, you can just find that on, uh, on online. Type in the, the Greek words. And that's why when you have a program like this, eSword, it's free. Uh, maybe a, uh, uh, like a five, ten bucks a year or something like that, depending on your platform or depending on your device. You can bring up all sorts of Bibles and everything else. I use KJV+. Plus. And do you know why I use KJV+. Plus? Let me show you. See this right here? These are the words, the Greek words in the New Testament, the Hebrew words in the Old Testament, and you get the word definitions. Look at that. G3952. So remember, it says these that are Christ, right? So it said, let's go back. Uh, da, 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 da. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. This word for coming is the Greek word 3952, okay? Remember I told you that other one? Look at this one. This one's only used 24 times. Remember the other word for coming that was related to the wolf? 639 times. So what happens if you're not using a program where you can get the concordance at your fingertips with the Greek word definitions and the Hebrew word definitions? You would read this word coming and you would just think, oh, this is his coming at pre-trib. You see? That's what a lot of people do. But when you get the definitions and you could seek and search them out, you realize that this one about the wolf is not the same as this one about Christ's coming. Okay? The 3952. Watch this. Let's go to the 3952, which is... Whoops. What am I doing here? There we go. Here's the Greek word, okay? G3952, coming, okay? It's about the future visible return of Christ, okay? Listen to this. Look at this. Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. It's not in another gospel except for Matthew. And you know why it's even more exciting? Because not only is it only in Matthew, but it's only in Matthew's discourse. Do you know why that's important? Because when you understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to realize that Matthew's discourse is to trumpets. It's to the seven years of trumpets. And this abomination of desolation is not the one from Mark's group during seals with the Antichrist and false prophet. This one is when Satan is cast down and Antichrist who was killed is brought back and the false prophet who wasn't killed is there as well. Now you got all three of them. But it's even worse than the one from Seals because now Satan is here as well. It's crazy stuff, right? And there's your word for winter again. Well, what about the word that we saw for Christ's coming? You see that? Listen to what they say at the beginning. Uh, in Matthew 24, verse 3, halfway through. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Hello. Only Matthew's discourse says this. Why? Because Matthew's is speaking to Judah. Theirs is the seven years of trumpets. During the time of seals, they're going to be removed. They're already going to be destroyed, removed from the land. And then their connection, their time, will be the seven years of trumpets that follows after. But you see, it's about his coming and the connection to the time of the end of the world. 
Look at when we get to the other one here. In Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning that cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's the same word. You see that? This lightning from one end unto the other, when he comes and the whole world will see him, is exactly related to exactly what you think I'm going to go to. <laughs> All right? It's directly related to Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 24, where he says, For as the lightning that lighteth out of one part in he under heaven and shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. Remember this? But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation, as it was in the days of Noah. You see why? Because this is all about the 40 days of the Son of Man after the pre-trib escape. Also, likewise, also, see, they did eat and drink. They bought and sold. This is coming to the end of seals, the buying and the selling because of the mark of the beast. Okay? Then he's talking about, see, he's telling them last, and then he says, but first. So again, when you're reading this in Matthew chapter 24, it's literally about when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. You'll even see where it's, uh, as it continues, see, immediately after the tribulation of those days, and there it is, the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And what does it say? You're going to want to remember these things. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Okay? With a great sound of a trumpet. And look at what we get. The days of Noah. We've taught on this many times. This days of Noah is not the one from Luke 17. This days of Noah is, is a typology of the actual one year approximately that the days of Noah were. This is when the six years of trumpets are over. You see that? This is the Son of Man having returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And when he returns, how do you know it's when he returns? Well, listen to what it says. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels that are in heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Four times it's used in Matthew's discourse. What is this coming? Well, if I just showed you that his coming was as lightning from one end unto the other, which means that the, at, it's at the end of tribulation, and he's telling you that his coming is going to be as the days of Noah, what were the days of Noah? They were represented by events that took about one year. Hello. Okay. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. See? Same story. It's going to play out. And then what do you get? Of course, if you go into Revela uh, uh, Matthew 25, it's then what will take place. Okay. Now it's the kingdom of heaven because for the Jews, theirs is the kingdom of heaven on earth. The, the pre-trib group and the mark group, theirs is the kingdom of God. One is in the third heaven. One is the portion of paradise. And what do we see? It's the story of the foolish and wise virgins. But when is this? This relates to the beginning of that final 14th year, that year as Noah's. Okay, The Lord has returned. It's that final year. Remember, they were 13 years old. They can get engaged. They, they would be you know, a uh, 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 betrothed, but he had to go and prepare a place for one year. And then he would return at that end of that 14th year. At the end of that final year, he would return. And what were they doing? The bridesmaids had to help prepare the bride. They had to watch, have oil, uh, uh, always had to have the oil ready because they didn't know when he was coming, but it was about one year. So you're going to see this is what's going on, right? They were foolish. There were, there were five foolish and wise. Some of them ran out of oil, but listen to this. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Okay? So we see this word for vessel. You're going to want to remember it because it's only used twice. It's pretty wild when you see this, guys. I think we're going to have greater insight now into a mystery that many of us have wondered about for a long time. I've got greater understanding of this now than I ever have before. So it's quite exciting. So, you see, 
when when is it that these wise virgins have oil in their vessels? In the seventh year of trumpets. Right? Seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, but the Lord returns at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. Binds Satan, destroys all who came against, right? Renews everything, has them go out to start teaching the ways of the Lord. And when that final year is complete and he's prepared the place, then the bride is brought to him, right? And what do we see? During that one year, the wise virgins, they are not brides, guys. They are not the brides, all right? It has nothing to do with pre-trib. It has nothing to do with mid-trib. This is his bride at the end. There's a pre-trib bride and there's his Judah bride at the end, okay? These are her bridesmaids. But you see, these ones have what? These ones have oil, so they've got the spirit, and it's in their vessel. What do you think another term for vessel could be? A body? Right? We've been called a vessel, right? Your body is called a vessel. You can say it's a vessel for the Lord, a vessel for the Spirit, right? Oil in your vessel. Remember that. You're going to see why it's important, because what is this all connected to? The final year at his coming. Remember, we're still in 1 Corinthians 15. This is all related to his coming and tied to the seventh year of trumpets. You see that? But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Just so happens, right? Just so happens, it's all about the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. And there's your 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Okay? Let's keep reading. Then comes the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. or so, Yeah, the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Has he done that yet? Nope. Because it's all about at his coming. It's not a pre-trib coming. It's his post-trib coming. It's when he's going to be seen as lightning from one end unto the other. Okay? Look at this. When he shall have put down all authority... Listen to this, verse 25, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Well, what do we know about death? Let's go to Isaiah, right? You guys remember this? Isaiah 65. Uh, da, 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 for behold, all things new. Listen to this. This is during the millennial reign. In fact, let's start in verse 17. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. You see, I create, okay, a new heavens and a new earth. Okay, what does he mean? Fresh new thing. Look at what it means. It doesn't mean what you think. It means to rebuild. It means to rebuild. This is all about when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, destroys the enemy, and he repairs the earth. Literally says repairs. He makes it new by repairing it. Okay? And how do we know? Listen to what it says. We go to verse uh, Isaiah 66, verse 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that has not, fi uh, that, that has not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. You see? There's still death. For the child shall die a hundred years old. Meaning, as you guys, everybody who's read this, all the pastors that have taught you, they're telling you, you see that in the millennial reign, people will live hundreds of years again as they did in the beginning. 
And when they do, if a child dies, if somebody dies at 100, it'll be as if they were just a child. So what do you see? Death is not yet put under his feet, which means he has to rule until what? He has to rule until death is put under his feet. You see? For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Well, listen to this. When the end comes, so at his coming, then comes the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, and he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign, okay? Which means this is all related then to when he comes in the final year and he establishes his reign during the millennial reign. Can we prove it? Absolutely we can prove it. I wouldn't be doing the video otherwise. <laughs> I love it. Watch this. Let's go to Matthew 28. Listen to Matthew 28 and the commission he gives them here. If you guys come to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to see that the last chapter of Luke, Mark, and Matthew are all a commission to separate groups of people in the end of days. Luke 24 is written to what we call the remnant bride. That group that I was saying in the, in the Dana Coverstone dream where they needed help, there's not enough workers, okay? They're the ones working in the harvest, but there's not enough workers and they need more to come in. These guys are working. They're with the Lord for 40 days and then they're here during seals. Mark's group, at the end of Mark's gospel, it's the ones that Jesus unbraids on, right? He gives, he rails on them. And it relates to the 144,000 who he seals at the beginning, at the end of the sixth year of seals, at the beginning of the seventh, <clears throat> That's why you see it in Revelation chapter 7. You see the 144,000 sealed. That's why in Revelation 14, you see them on heavenly Mount Zion with them because the Lord is there now on Mount Zion and they go out during trumpets. But Matthew's group, when you get to Matthew 28, it's a third group because there are these three watchmen group, one for seals, one for trumpets, and one for the millennial reign. Listen to what he tells them. Uh, Matthew 28, 16. This is one of those things that you will see the difference in these patterns within the Gospels and that these commissions are completely different from each other. Where they meet, the words that are said, what they're to do, they're completely different. One, he sits down and eats. The other ones, he doesn't serve and he, and he rails on them. It's completely different. The reason is prophecy was built into the Gospels, and it's everywhere. Well, listen to this. Uh, then the 11th point of the mountain, Matthew 28, starting in 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? They worshipped him, but some doubted. Do you know we don't read about some doubted anywhere except in Matthew 28? And one more place, right? Isn't there one more place where some doubted, right? Isn't there a place where actually one famous one doubted? Like Thomas, doubting Thomas. Do you know that doubting Thomas is related to John chapter 20 as if it's like right at the end, right? Right, it relates to the very end of the 20th year to the start of the 21st year. It's right when the Lord's returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Isn't that something? You're going to see as we go through this that it's as the seventh trumpet begins to sound. It hasn't even fully sounded. It's when it's beginning to sound is like between this little line here from the end of 20 to the start of 21 of John which is the end of the 13th year to the start of the 14th or the end of the sixth year of trumpets to the very beginning of the seventh year of trumpets. Do you think that's interesting? That that's where Doubting Thomas is? And in Matthew, it's in Matthew 28, which is directly, absolutely 100% connected to when the Lord returns at the end of the sixth year of trumpets to the start of the seventh year of trumpets? Do you think that's just by chance? 
Matthew 28, verse 18. Listen to this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Hello. All power is now being given to him in heaven and in the earth. Some people would say, well, he already has it. In, in the spiritual sense. <clears throat> but not in this literal sense, he doesn't. He's had it in the spiritual, but obviously, uh, where is that power daily, regularly being played out, right? The enemy is still very victorious right now. When he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, ain't no more power over the, for the enemy. All power is given unto him. This is why he then tells them, teach them to observe all things that I command you, right? He's no longer telling them to preach because the whole world will know. And what does he tell them? I am with you now until the end of the world. So here we see that now all power is given unto him in heaven and in earth. Well, let's go to Revelation. Go to Revelation, where is it? Uh, chapter 11. Chapter 11. And what do we get? We get to the end of the sixth trumpet, which is the second woe. And look at what it says at the seventh trumpet when it sounds. There were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That doesn't happen until the seventh trumpet. What's the seventh trumpet? The beginning of the final year of trumpets. When he puts down all rule and all reign and all authority. When it's lightning from one end unto the other. When the whole world will see him. These are all directly connected to 1 Corinthians 15. Related to precisely what he said. That but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, yes, the literal end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. We just read it. Every one of those things was directly connected to the final year of trumpets. For he must reign till everything's put under his feet, including death. Well. What did he say in Matthew 28? That he's going to now rule and reign and he'll be here with them until the end of the world. Because he's now here with them until the end of the world, which is the end of the millennial reign. Well, look at what it says. For he must reign until he has done that. So here he is having put down all authority, which is what? At the end of the seventh, uh, at the seventh year of trumpets, right? In that final 14th year. And then it says, for he must reign. Well, when does he reign? Let's go have a look at Revelation again. Revelation chapter 20. Remember what he said, and they that are his. Okay, remember that part too? Let's go back, 1 Corinthians 15, watch this. Because it's what? Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are his at his coming. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20. Listen to what it says, okay? Those that never took the souls, those that were beheaded for Christ, never received the mark in their hands or in their forehead. What does it say? And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So is Christ ruling and reigning yet? Nope. He does not have all power and all authority in the, in the physical sense, in this world. It, spiritually, he's already won. He's already got the victory. If he didn't, we wouldn't be here. There would be no reason to be in Christ. He absolutely is already won. But the events haven't played out yet. The game isn't over yet. Oh, it's over in the spiritual realm. We know Christ is won. We've got the book. We're teaching from it. But it doesn't change the fact that the game is still being played, right? The the. The, the salvation story, the, the storyline is still being played out. 
What did it say in 1 Corinthians 15? It said then he would what? Reign. So when he comes, those who are what? Being resurrected, who are going to reign with him for a thousand years? And listen to what it says. But the rest of the dead. So this means there's a group resurrected after, right? At the end of tribulation, which is after 2,000 years is done. And then the rest of the dead, not until after the millennial reign, which is 3,000 years from his death and resurrection. Okay? Um, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Starting to make more sense? For those that were that were confused within it, trying to understand. You see, this is all the story of the resurrection of the dead. He tells you it's at the end of trumpets. He's telling you it's when the end comes. He's telling you it's when he has all power and all authority. It tells you when he's going to be reigning. And that during this reigning for a thousand years, the last one he's going to destroy is death. See? Verse 27, for he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. Who put all things under Christ's feet? His father, right? And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Huh. Gets interesting, doesn't it? You see? When you read about this, you can read about this more in, uh, what is it, Romans? Is it Romans 11? Listen to this. Romans 11, Romans 11. Gentiles grafted in, the fullness thereof. Listen to this. Romans chapter 11, verse, starting in verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but right, he's talking about the Jews, right? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Okay, that's what we're doing. We're to provoke them to jealousy. So imagine when the pre-trib comes and the jealousy that will come from that, right? Now, if the fall of them, okay? So if the fall of the Jews be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles in as much I, as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, you see the church, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? but life from the dead. Who was given the promise? The Jews, right? Abraham, even Daniel was told to lie in his plot until the last day. The resurrection of the dead is at the end of tribulation, in that seventh year of trumpets. Okay, we're going to keep going. Ah, da, 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 maybe I should be in jeopardy. Okay, resurrection. Okay, watch this. Now let's keep going with this other stuff that I have pulled up. And that is, okay. Let me show you this. You see, 
one of the one of the main questions is okay we can now show that it's post and we're going to spend some more time in it showing some other things but that doesn't really say that it can't also be you know a pre-trib resurrection of the dead or a, a mid-trib rapture resurrection of the dead well then these things that we read in scripture don't make any sense right watch this where was that uh philippians I'd read it from here, but I want to have it with the e sword. Okay, it is Philippians 1. Let's go to e sword. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1 and read what Paul said. This is what he said. Philippians 1, verse, uh, verse, starting in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I want not. For I am in a strix between two, having a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, I abide in the flesh. I mean, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you see what he's saying here everybody knows this one right paul's saying man i'm i'm between a, a straight here right I, I would much rather go and be with the lord but i'm here with you in the flesh because you need me that's what he's telling them right i know why i have to remain and i have to remain it's for you guys but i would much rather be out of this flesh and what be with christ so a lot of the question that people have is, are all the dead that have died in Christ since uh, since his death and resurrection, since the spirit came, is everybody that's dead in Christ still in their grave waiting? The answer is no. The answer is no. They're already with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You understand, we don't need these flesh suits. What would you need this flesh suit to be changed to go to heaven for? There's no point. You're not going to be like Christ where you're going to be coming and going. It's the spiritual realm. There's no need for a flesh, for any flesh. There is no resurrection from the dead because everybody that already died in Christ as a Luke pre-trib person, but did so over the last 2,000 years before the escape, is already there in his presence. The reason for the pre-trib that are being taken before it all begins is because theirs is not the tribulation. Those that are in Christ must be saved first. They've got to be removed before it can all begin. There is no resurrection of the dead at the beginning. There's no need. There's no need for a change of this body into something else. They're already present with the Lord. Okay? So then that brings the question, well, what about the mid-trib rapture group? This is telling you, absent from the flesh is present with the Lord. We know that scripture too, right? So let's go see, what about the rapture group? If we go in Luke chapter 23, we already have that answer as well, right? Jesus is on the cross. And what happens to Jesus on the cross where oh, I went too far? What happens to Jesus on the cross? Why am I going too far, too far, too far? I know it's this one. Oh, there it is. In Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 42, okay? We know that there were the, the, the two thieves on the cross, right? And in Luke, listen to what you hear. 23, starting in verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou come into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
Hello. What do you think that means? Right? What about, oh, he wasn't baptized. Uh, he, he didn't get water baptized. He never had uh, all this remission of sin stuff. And he believed in Christ in that moment. You see, this guy never had the opportunity to live out the rest of his life to see if he would remain in Christ, you see? We got scriptures telling us that everywhere. But in this moment, he believed, he repented, the Lord knew it, and he told him he would be with him in paradise. Why on earth didn't he tell him he would be with him in the third heaven? Why wouldn't he be with him in the third heaven? Remember that? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The first group goes to the third heaven. The second group goes to paradise. The great multitude was caught up rapture goes to paradise. This is the pre-trib above the 14 years. This is paradise in the seventh year of trumpets. And this is the Lord in the typology saying, now the third time I am coming to you. Why didn't this guy get told that he was going to the third heaven? because he never was baptized. He wasn't water baptized. Remember that? In John chapter 3. So he wasn't baptized. He committed his life right there and then. And he got to go to paradise. So are there people who have died over the last couple thousand years that weren't really in Christ? That didn't get to be like those who died in Christ to go to the third heaven? but died throughout the last 2,000 years that believed in Christ, that, that called out his name, that repented there and maybe even before their death, that got to go to paradise? Absolutely. This is absolutely 100% what it says. Did he get a new body for it? What was the point of this body? Oh, he didn't get a body. That body was taken down, buried, right? There's no resurrection of the dead for this guy. He was going to be in paradise with the Lord at that time. So again, no resurrection of the dead necessary or needed here. And we, we see this all throughout. Over and over and over again, this is explained and revealed to us. Even here, you go into Revelation chapter 7, where the great multitude rapture happens, and you see what? You see those that were clothed in white robes, those that were killed during seals, right? By the Antichrist, comma, and, you guys remember that whole story, comma, and, which means a separate group. So there's this group and there's this group, but they're there together as one. The ones clothed in white were the ones that died, and the ones with palms in their hands were the ones that survived and went to the rapture alive the ones that never tasted of death for the rapture group. There's, there's no resurrection of the dead. This is the group going to paradise. You see, the third heaven and paradise are both part of the kingdom of God. None of which have a resurrection from the dead. The only group that has a resurrection from the dead is, of course, Matthew's group. Check this out. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. It's been a while since I spoke on this, but you guys will remember this, those that have been around for a little bit. In Matthew chapter 27, sir, give me one second here. You'll remember that you find this only in Matthew's gospel. It's very important to understand these differences within the Gospels. Listen to what it says. Okay, here's Jesus having died on the cross. And listen to what it says. In Matthew 27, starting in verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept 
arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the city and appeared to many. Huh. Interesting that this is only in Matthew's gospel. Do you see the connection? Matthew, 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 Matthew. When you go to the video of um, a, a, a pre, mid, and post, you're going to see that in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, the resurrection story, the transfiguration story, and the, um, uh, 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 what's the other one? Uh, triumphal entry story, all three of them are typologies within the different wording in them of the pre, mid, and post. So again, if they're all a, a typology of the pre, mid, and post, and we're in Matthew 27, which is a typology of the post, do you know where that puts us again? Right here. In the exact same place again. In the exact same place where the resurrection of the dead, we are told, at his coming would be. Why was this group, why did they resurrect? Why did this group resurrect in Christ's time, right? Because there is an is that happened. Why did they resurrect? Because they never had the chance to receive the Holy Ghost. This, I believe, is absolutely a, the group of people that were in Christ, that believed in Christ, but died during his ministry and never had the opportunity to receive the Holy Ghost. I believe that was the reason these guys rose from the dead. But the prophetic implication for them prophetically is the typology of the resurrection of the dead in the final year at his return. Okay? Watch this. Let's play this out now in the story of Jonah. I was telling you guys earlier we would do this with Jonah. Okay? Once you understand, if you're new, once you understand these differences in the Gospels and you come to this Jonah story, it is going to blow your mind. It reveals so much. It goes so deep and it gets so heavy that it can turn some people off. And what I mean by that is because it could freak them out what it reveals. When you get to the Gospel of Matthew and Jonah's story and you realize what it means and what it's saying, man, it's, it, could be, it could be hard to take in. But one thing to understand is it's okay. He's in control. He knows absolutely what he is doing. The Father has predetermined it. It's already preset. The Lord is ready for it. So we don't need to panic. We don't like to hear it. <clears throat> but it doesn't make it any less true. And I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'm going to have to show it so that you guys can see where this resurrection is. Because you see, when you get to Matthew 27, and you see that it says, and he resurrected from, right? That they, when the, when the, great, when the earthquake happened, and he had resurrected first, then they resurrected. And if the pre, mid, and post are all the typology in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, of the resurrection story, the, the, right? The crucifixion and resurrection story is a typology of pre, mid, and post. You're going to see why it's important. You see, look at the story of Jonah. In the story of Jonah, Jesus says, no sign is going to be given, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. 11, Luke 11, verse 30. For as Jonah was the sign unto the Ninevites, so shall, so also, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Everybody thinks that Jesus was already a sign as Jonah was after his resurrection for 40 days. He wasn't. This has not been fulfilled. 
period. When Jesus resurrected and he was here for 40 days, was he going around warning that Jerusalem was about to be attacked and destroyed? No. Yet the world of church will tell you this was already fulfilled. He did not do as Jonah did. Jonah went in there to warn them that if they didn't repent, they were going to be destroyed. When Jesus resurrected, did he do that? Nope. You see? It hasn't been fulfilled. And you're going to understand it by the differences in the Gospels. Okay? And then it says the Queen of the South did rise up. Okay? This is a prophetic insight, which is in the, in the intro series, you're going to see the story of the 40 days of the Son of Man. He is coming during those first 50 days of Luke's discourse. He is coming after the escape. There's the seven-day wedding of the Gentile bride. He returns on the eighth day. He's here for 40 days. He leaves, and then for three days, Jerusalem gets compassed about. The Holy Spirit anoints that worker group. On the 50th day, they go out from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is destroyed, and the 14 years of tribulation begins. That is proven a hundred different ways throughout the ministry, okay? In the Word. This is the representation of those 40 days of the Son of Man. This is why in Luke 17, he said his days would be as it was in the days of Noah. Yet in the verse before, he said that in his day, it would be as lightning from one end unto the other. So obviously it's not the same coming. There's, there's different connections, right? So. Look what happens now if we go to Mark. In Mark's story of Jonah, listen to what it says. Uh, Mark 8, verse 12. And he sighed deeply, right? So they're seeking a sign. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, entering into a ship, and again departed to the other side. That is one of the biggest contradictions that people have when searching out the scriptures. This is one that Muslims talk about, that churches talk about, theologians talk about, and they try to understand what it was. But they have no problem going to Luke's and going to Matthew's and trying to say that it already happened, it already took place. Yet Jesus didn't do the one in Luke's yet. And in Mark's, he says they won't get a sign and he left. We've explained what this means, why they won't get a sign. And it's because when you go to Mark's transfiguration story in chapter 9, they, they have no sign given to them. You see, it says, Verily I say unto you, Mark 9 verse 1, Verily I say unto you, that there shall be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. What we know is we know that he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's coming with paradise at the end of the sixth seal. That's why everybody's crawling into the rocks and the mountains fall on us. Everybody's panicking. But that's still not the rapture. They will have seen him come. But they still don't know when the rapture will happen. They don't know when their time is. It's about the middle of the seventh year, but they have no idea. That's why they will have seen it come. In Mark's, it reads differently. In Matthew's, it reads differently. And you're going to see that in the pre, mid, and post video because this all goes to the transfiguration story. Well, when we go to Matthew's story about Jonah, listen to what it says. Here it is. In Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 39, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it. But, you see, this one, there's an exception. <clears throat> the sign of the prophet Jonah. Remember what it said in, in Matthew's discourse? Right? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sign, right? They were seeking this sign. What's this sign going to be? Listen to what it says. For as Jonah was three days and three 
nights. In the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Do you know what people will tell you? Let me go to a calendar. People will tell you that Christ, okay, was taken and crucified, had to be put in the grave before sunset, right? He was put in the grave, so he was there for all the 15, let me do half days, okay? He was taken to the hands of sinful men. He was crucified, had to be put in the grave before sunset, okay? So he wasn't put in the grave till the afternoon of the 14th of Nisan. He was put in the grave before sunset because it was the Sabbath, and he was in it during that Sabbath day until early in the morning on the 16th, which means he was literally only in the grave one day and a half to very early in the morning, plus whatever this afternoon portion was from when they took him down before they put him in the grave. Hello. He was not three days and three nights. You see, again, this is something that the church has pulled this wool over your eyes. And, and maybe, I'm not saying they even did it on purpose because they never understood it because they never understood the differences in the Gospels. Three days and three nights. Do you know why it says it so specifically? Because it's telling you it was three days of light, time, light daytime, and three nights of darkness time. Which means what? Sometime on the fourth day. Hello. Sometime on the fourth day. But Christ wasn't in the grave for more than a little bit than a day and a half. But do you know what the Jews have told Christians and what Christians have bought? It was a portion of the 14th, the 15th, and half of the 16th. So any portion of one day is called a day. Oh, yeah, but it's not called a night. It was three days and three nights, it said. Do you know why? Because he's never fulfilled this yet. And that's hard to take in. What do you mean? He's still going to go to the grave for three days and three nights and then come up after three days and three nights? Yeah, that's what it means. Watch this. If you go to Luke and we go to Luke's resurrection story, you'll understand why I'm tying this in. But listen to what they were told in Luke 24, 17. Okay? Remember that he was risen when he was in Galilee, verse 7, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, comma, and. So this was part one. This happened, right, in the evening of the 14th of Passover, right? 14th of Nisan. Comma and be crucified. This happened in the daytime portion, right, before evening. Comma and the third day rise again. When? He rose the third day. He wasn't in the grave even for three days. He was taken into the hands of sinful men. He was crucified and then he was buried. But he, his resurrection was on the third day. But the entire count started from when he was taken into the hands of sinful men. He was taken from the, uh, the hands of sinful men in the evening of the 14th after the Passover meal. He was crucified on the daytime of the 14th before sunset. And then he was put in the grave for all the 15th. And when they got there early in the morning on the 16th, he was already resurrected. He was only in the grave for a little over a day and a half. Everywhere you read, I believe it's 14 or 15 times 
it says it was the third day. Three days and three nights in the grave. Never mind the taking of a, into the hands of sinful men. Never mind the time of crucified. The entire story is on the third day he resurrected, which is about two and a half days, two and a half days and change. The other said it was three days and three nights in the grave, not including hands of sinful men and being crucified. How do you account for that? How do you account for that? There's only one way to account for it. And it's knowing that the Lord must do it again. You see, why in Matthew's story, when he's going into the heart of the earth, why is he going there? He's got to set the captives free, right? Isn't there a group of people in, in the holding area? You've got the group that's over in hell, right? But then you've got another group like where Abraham is. Remember that? We're in Abraham's bosom. I think that's Luke 16, if I recall correctly. Uh, yeah, clothing purple, Lazarus. Okay. Here it is in verse 20, 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes and being in torments, he see, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So you got one side is hell and you've got this big chasm in the middle and you've got this other side where these guys, it only feels like days. They're just chilling for a little bit. Jesus hasn't gone to take these guys out yet. This resurrection that the world of church tries to tell you happened of all the Old Testament saints and everything, it never happened. He only resurrected a few hundred people that went back into the cities. They were people that were believers in Christ that never had the chance of the Spirit. You see, if you go to Daniel, look at what Daniel chapter 12 says. Okay? Well, even, yeah, let's start in, in the end of verse 12, of chapter 12. But go thy way till the end be. Go thy way until the extremity of the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy plot at the end of the days. Not at the beginning of the end of days, not in the middle of the end of days, at the extreme end of days. Wouldn't Daniel have been resurrected? Right? Wouldn't Daniel be one of the ones like Abraham and the rest of them that should have been part of the resurrection of the dead if it already happened? You see? Again, there it is. End of days. You're going to see this stuff everywhere when it talks about end of days. How about this one? Remember this with um, Daniel 12, uh, starting at the beginning. And it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which shall stand for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. Okay? So Michael's going to stand. It's the beginning of trumpets, as we shared in the last video. It's going to be a time of trouble since it never was because when Michael's victorious, Satan is cast down, the pit is open, and it's mid-trumpets. It's Matthew's abomination of desolation that starts, and it's absolute chaos, right? So, listen to this. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was ever, uh, since there was a nation even unto this time. And at thy time, thy, at that time, Thy people shall be delivered, everyone which shall be found written in the book. Okay? And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay? The wise shall shine as the brightness in the firmament and brightness of the stars. But then look at what he says. Some people say, well, see, this is, uh, I don't know, end of seals, they might say. I don't know what they're saying this is. This is telling you 
trumpets. This is telling you the second half of trumpets right here. The time of trouble such as was never since there was a nation. Let me prove it to you. Let's go to Matthew in his discourse again, Matthew 24. Okay, this is mid trumpets, three and a half years in when Messiah is going to be cut off. And listen to what it says. Verse 21, at the time of winter, Matthew 24, verse 21, for then shall be great, great tribulation, tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. See? So why does he say then that many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake? Because now he's reading right to the end. Okay? This is to the time, this is where Michael stands up to start tribulation of trumpets, when there's the battle against Satan. This is when Satan is cast down. It's the time of trouble since there never was. And then you have everyone that's going to be delivered. And how do we know that the rest of the story then explains? Well, listen to what it says. In verse 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words of this book and seal it till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. And what happens? In verse 6, he says, um, it says, and one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? You see, what's he talking about? How long is this going to be? This time of trouble that never was since it all began. How long is this period of time going to be? And that's when he tells them a time times and a half which is the two and a half years of the second half of trumpets, leaving one year of trumpets when the Lord returns feet down, right? When the Lord returns feet down, and what happens? Then many are resurrected and so forth, right? When are they going to resurrect? Well, let's prove it. Listen to what it says. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Didn't we just prove that in the Daniel last video we did in Daniel? You see, when does it get accomplished when all this is finished? Then what did it say? When, when, when this time happens and this two and a half years is finished, what did it say? Then the books would be open, those that were lying in, 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 the, in the graves, right? Listen to what it says. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall, listen to this, begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. At the seventh trumpet, so at the very end of the sixth trumpet, to the very beginning of the seventh, as the, the lips are at the trumpet, and it's just beginning to blow, the mystery is over. Why? Because at that point, the war against the two witnesses will have finished that lasted for two and a half years. And what happens? Huh. At the same hour, a great earthquake. So the seventh trumpet or the sixth trumpet ends with a great earthquake before it is finished. That's the Lord returning feet down. <clears throat> the story of Satan and that portion for him now being bound for a thousand years will begin. And what does it start with? At the very end of the sixth trumpet, to the start of the sounding of the seventh, it's going to start with a great earthquake. What do we know happens at the great earthquake? Huh. Matthew 28, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came back and rolled away the stone of the door. And his countenance was like lightning. Because it's a representation of Christ. Remember Matthew 24? His discourse was the same at the coming of Christ. What is it going to be like at what? At his coming? 
Lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west. He's going to be as lightning from one end unto the other. Every single part of this stuff, every part, every piece is telling us that the resurrection of the dead is at the end of the sixth trumpet. Even here, them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And what was Daniel even told? To wait till the end. That he would stand in his lot at the end of days. It's, it's awesome to understand these things. When you understand the revelation of the Gospels, you can understand these things, brothers and sisters. Who else gets part in this, remember? We know that another group gets part in this as well. Revelation chapter 2, right? This one I won't spend a lot of time. We all know this. This is the workers. <clears throat> these are the Luke 24 group that I was telling you earlier. The, the, last, the, the end of the last chapter of the commission in Luke is the Smyrna group. The, the commission at the end of Mark's gospel in Mark 16 is the Philadelphia group. The, the commission at the end of Matthew's gospel is the commission of those who go out during the millennial reign to teach the ways of the Lord, which is why he's there now with them until the end of the world. So what happens to this group? We know they're going out during seals. Some of them are going to be tested. Some of them are going to be put in prison and put to death, but they're going to have a crown of life. And what does it say that this group will get? He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay? This is the Lord God's people. These were his priests. These were the ones, the, the priest type going out. His seals workers, his disciples who were in Christ following him, understood their understanding being open. The Holy Ghost anoints them. They're the ones going out to work during seals. Many of them are going to die, or some of them are going to die along the way. But what do we see in Revelation 20? Those that never took the mark, those that were beheaded, right? Some of them being put to death. What do they get to do? They're going to be the ones that will reign with Christ a thousand years. You see? But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. See? Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. Okay? Again, Christ doesn't reign until he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives and takes control. Destroys Satan, right? Binds him, destroys all the enemies. And at the seventh trumpet, who ends up going into the pit? The false prophet and the Antichrist. Right? Both of them are cast into the pit. And then what do we have? Okay? Let me make sure I'm, I'm keeping on track. I want to make sure this part is all following somewhat of the order that I had here. Okay? So, then what do we have? Well, then we have, this is what? This is the end of 2,000 years. They rule and reign with Christ for 1,000. This is the Smyrna group. And then what happens? When the 1,000 years are over, it's the end of 3,000 years. What do we know this means to the Lord God? Two days and three days, right? So where do we see this? We, of course, see this in Hosea. In Hosea chapter 6, listen to what it says. Come, let us return. So this is, this is like the world, right? The house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in. This is the world coming to the Lord at the end of the sixth seal. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal. See, listen to this. See, when did they get torn in pieces? Many of them during seals, right? All right, Antichrist trampled them and everything else. And he will heal us. He hath smitten. Okay, he has smitten us, strayed, killed some. And he will bind us up. And after two days, he will revive us. 
And in the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Listen to this. Verse three. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. Wow. What, what's, this, what's this entire story? It's a story of after the 2,000 years and after the 3,000th year. So we go back to Revelation chapter 20. There's those being resurrected after 2,000 to rule and reign with him. And then you've got the 1,000 years and this group that ruled and reigned with them. And then what does it say? Then we know after the 1,000 years, uh, Satan is released. And you have the battle of Gog and Magog, not the battle of Gog of Magog. And it says, uh, to, gather, uh, uh, to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them, okay? This is no battle like end of seals or end of trumpets. This is the father, whoo, and it's over. And listen to what it says. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Go into verse 20. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Remember, this is the end of the millennial reign now. And I saw the dead. Okay, what, who did he see? The dead. It gets to be very interesting wording here. You see, now it's about the dead. Well, those who are in Christ are not dead. You never die. Your flesh will be gone, but you'll never be dead. So listen where these people come from. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. According to their works. Huh. There's a group of dead that'll be judged according to their works, yet there is no need for a resurrection of the dead for those who are in paradise, for those who are in the third heaven. This is a judgment for the dead according to their works. What you're going to see is this sounds a lot more like it's the resurrection of the dead, including those from the Old Testament. Remember the Old Testament, right? Those in the days before Christ, there was law. But what do you say to the whole world that didn't know? What about the whole world that didn't know this difference? Christ wasn't there to be able to save them. Does everybody get a pass? No, of course not. So what about all the Jews that were disobedient, but they were his people? What about the works that they were doing, which is what the law was for them? You're going to see the piece of scripture that says this other portion is to the Gentiles. Not this. Okay, because this is according to their works. And look at where they were delivered up from. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them death and hell is one and the sea is another the sea had the dead death and hell delivered up their dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works but I thought we weren't judged according to our works. We're not. Ours is faith in Christ alone. 
but your works show that you belong to Christ. You see, there's a difference between just saying you believe in Jesus. You ever watch or you ever read biographies or watch stories on biographies of so many of these criminals, whether they're mob. I like those gangster movies or those mob and uh, CIA and all that stuff. But if you ever read on um, on some of these mob guys or or what's that big uh, drug cartel guy? Oh, shoot. Everybody knows him, right? Um, he was always proclaiming Christ. He would turn around after murdering dozens of people and doing all these drug deals and billions of dollars and everything else. And he would do good works for his community, claiming that, that he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what about that guy? What about that guy? What about somebody who just, who does all those things, yet claims to believe in Jesus Christ? Obviously, his works are saying otherwise than what his words are saying. That's kind of the point, right? But to the Gentiles, we are saved by faith, right? To We are saved by faith in Christ. But how we live our lives in Christ, if Christ is really in us, is by our actions. Our actions don't save us. Our actions are the evidence of our being saved. That's what it means. This is not the same. Because these are the dead being judged by their works. We are not dead. We will never die. The body will be gone and we will be with Christ, still in our full spirit, in our spirit. And, and I could be dead right now and having this conversation, it would continue and I'd be with the Lord. And I'd be like, whoa, what just happened? That's how quick we won't even notice it. Do you think you're going to be judged according to your works when you get to heaven? I'm sure there's churches that have taught you that. That's not what, what's going to happen. You're going to be rewarded according to your works in heaven. Hello. Not judged by them. These are for the dead. And who are the ones that are dead that would have done works in that time? Okay? This is, this is even to the point of the end of the millennial reign. But you see, there's some from the sea and there's some from death and hell. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Now listen to this. And death and hell, okay? And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell. What about the sea? What about the sea? Is there something else going on here in relation to the sea? Remember what this all means to the Lord God, right? Two days, after two days, and on the third day. It's from Christ's death and resurrection. Two days is 2,000 years. Three days is 3,000 years. It's the end of the millennial reign. What is that a typology of? Right? We know the whole story is what? 22,000. So to the Lord God, you see, to us, this final year is what? The 14th year or the 21st year in the big picture. But it's also a typology of what? The thousand years. Right? This will be the beginning time of the thousand years. I mean, these are actual years that we're living in but they're actually going to be a thousand year millennial reign. But it doesn't change to the Lord that it's only going to be a day. You know why? Because the 22nd thousandth year or the 22nd day to the Lord is the end of the millennial reign and is called the new beginning. To those on the earth, it's going to be the new beginning. It'll be the 50th Jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign. But in the typology to the Lord God, in the thousand years, and the thousand years is a day and a day and a thousand and all that, 
we know in the end times, their years, and the 21st is that same one. So it's like saying at the end of the 14th year or the end of the 21st year or 21st thousand. You following? Some of you may not if you're newer. But this is that same period of time. It's at the end of the 21st or 21st thousandth year. Because with the Lord, it'll pass by as a day. But for those on earth, it's going to be a year and the beginning of 1,000 years. Okay, the 14th year and the beginning of 1,000 years. Well, watch where this goes. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Listen to this. In Ephesians chapter 6, starting, I think it's right here. Let me make sure. Yeah. Let's start in, no, let's start in 10. 10, 10, 10, principles of darkness. No, not 10. No, standing righteousness, preparation. Where did I just see that? Am I in the right spot? Ah, oh, that would explain it. I'm like, wait a second, I'm missing something. Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, listen to this. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But who is he speaking to? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So see, prior to this, we were aliens. We were strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So what happens to everybody pre-Christ? They were strangers and aliens. They had no part in the commonwealth, the covenants. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the, blood of Je by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances. Verse 19. Uh, let me see. Verse 19, now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. Who's he speaking to, guys? He's speaking to the Gentiles. You see, verse 11, wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Who are called uncircumcision by them that are called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands you see what it said by that which is called which is jews the circumcision in the flesh listen to this made by hands who made them by hands the lord god remember genesis chapter 2 you see we get part in this now uncircumcised, circumcised, it doesn't matter anymore. But it's talking to who? It's talking to the Gentiles. The Gentiles. So do you think there's a reason maybe why Jews still bicker and, and aren't prepared and, and, and are trying to do the law of, of, of uh, following the commandments and the Testament and all that stuff, all the old commandments? Because that's what was theirs. Remember, they've been blinded. They've been blinded. And as much as some people like to argue and come against them, we're to pray for them and to lift them up. We've been grafted in. 
We've been given a part of this portion which is theirs, which is the flesh made by hand. You see? But this is talking to the Gentiles. It's the Gentiles who were the ones that were aliens. It's the Gentiles who got grafted in. It's the Gentiles who, who were part of the circumcision but didn't have to be circumcised. You see, we do good works, but not because it's what saves us. Whereas the Jews were doing what? What did they have to do in the Old Testament? There was no salvation through faith. Oh, there was, the, there was still the faith in God, absolutely. You're going to see Abraham had it, of course. But in it, he did good works as he lived by faith. Okay, listen to this. Let's go to James. I think it was James that was chapter 6. No, <laughs> James is chapter 2, of course, as well. So in James chapter 2, listen to what James chapter 2 says. Start in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say, he hath faith and have not works. Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food. Hear that? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful of the, uh, to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead and alone. Yes, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble see not much trembling by most people right the devils not only believe but they also tremble but are they doing good works no you see they believe but they're not living it to live it is doing works but it's not necessarily the thing that saves you it's the evidence that you actually are in christ but will thou now O vain man, uh, sorry, but will thou now, O vain man, did I say it again? <laughs> but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? He was justified by works. What are we justified through? Faith. Right? Here we are reading about all those who are about to be judged at the end by their works. There's some from the sea and the other portion from death and hell. One portion from the sea, another portion from death and hell. And all those from death and hell if you see death and hell being cast into the pit, what about those that were in death and hell? Probably in the pit as well, right? Probably off to the left and cast into the lake of fire. But the sea wasn't. So what happened to those that were in the sea? If the sea is being represented as not being the one that was thrown into the lake of fire, and that there was a group being judged and justified by their works. What if we go back into Luke chapter 16? What did we see where Abraham was with Lazarus? The rich man was in hell. So you have hell and death. And hell and death are cast into the lake of fire. And this guy is there, and what does he see? 
he sees Abraham far off. This is awesome. This is just dawning on me now, by the way. He sees Abraham afar off. What does he ask Abraham to do? Verse, Luke 16, verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send me Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water. Where do you think this water is? Do you think it's in hell where the guy is complaining and screaming in his torment? Of course not. Death and hell were also the ones in Revelation 20 at the end of the millennial reign that got cast into the pit, <clears throat> right? Into the lake of fire. Abraham, where Lazarus is, is where the water is. Abraham, where Abraham is, is where the water is. Death and hell is where the torment of those being cast into the lake of fire are. And hell is not the place with the water. That's awesome. Especially when you see where this goes. Making sense? Abraham justified by works. Okay? By works. Let's keep going. And then I'm gonna, you're going to see where this ties in. Uh, James 2.22. Seest thou how faith wrought with works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works, a man is justified and not by faith alone. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Two groups, right? The body without the spirit and faith without works. The group that is justified by works are the Old Testament ones. Their works justified their faith. Right? Us, we are saved through faith in Christ. But our works are our reward when we get there. Our works in this life are the evidence that he is in us and we are in him. Let me bring you back to this at the end of the millennial reign. They are judged according to their works and the sea, which is what? Water, right? And the sea gave up the dead which was in it, which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Who was written in this book of life? The Old Testament ones? The ones that were in the portion of the water like Abraham was and, and uh, Lazarus that it was in his bosom when the one who was in hell was crying over to bring water to put on his tongue? I believe we just found this. I believe we just found that connection. You see? The second death has nothing to do with that other group. Remember what's going to happen uh, when the Lord returns, right? This resurrection of the dead, of some of those that were dead, this resurrection that's going to take place. 
those that were told of the promise, those that are going to rule and reign with him for the millennial reign? Check this out. I told you this is going to go to a really exciting place. Check this out. John chapter 6. It's a very strange place to see it, but I remember this from years ago. You're going to see the last day, I think, five or six times here. Listen to this. Uh, we'll start in John 6, verse 37. All that the Father... Okay, yeah, let's start in verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. There it is again. See? And this is the will of him that sent me. Every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Where's all this raising up happening? At the last day. Do you remember what his last day was in Luke 20, uh, in Luke 17? Lightning from one end unto the other. That is his day. That is the last day, the resurrection day. <laughs> it's the Matthew 28 resurrection again. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up. At the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. When does the teaching happen? <laughs> At the last day. Remember, it happens in the final year, and they go out during the millennial reign. Where is that? Again, the resurrection and the commission given to those in Matthew 28. No more, no more preaching only teaching, right? Every man, therefore, that heareth and learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verse 49, your fathers did eat in the wilderness, listen to this, and are dead. Huh. Your fathers did eat in the wilderness <coughs> and are dead. Who ate in the wilderness of the manna? Those that he rescued in the Old Testament, his people? And yet they're dead. Right? There was no salvation through Christ. So they died eating the, the bread manna. When is their judgment coming? the judgment of the dead in the last day. There's a group from the sea and there's a group from death and hell. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and shall not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Okay? Uh, verse 54 Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh of my blood, he hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Over and over and over and over again. Verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread will live forever. See, who are they? that ate the manna that came down from heaven, yet are dead. It's the Old Testament. This is, this is 
the other resurrection at the end even of the millennial reign. It's all over the place. Now watch this. Remember, this is all connected to that to a portion of that group in the sea, right? Well, check this out. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 13, this is actually really awesome. Okay? In Matthew chapter 13 is the only place you're going to see this conversation. You don't find it in Mark or Luke. And in John, where you see this conversation, see this stuff when we were talking in chapter 6, you see all this conversation of the sea, the sea, the sea. And then only in 21 of John, okay, you see the sea in verse 1 and in verse 7. But I'm about to show you a connection that I believe is going to bring more understanding to the revelation of the understanding of John chapter 21. Are you ready for this? Here is <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13. Listen to what this says. Did I not highlight it there? Let me make sure I'm in the right spot. Yeah, 47. <clears throat> Listen to this, okay? In Matthew 13, the entire conversation is about what? In the end of the world, okay? The wheat and the tares, this separation that at the very end will take place. The chaff will be burnt up, right? And when is it? In the end of the world, in the end of the world. Now listen to what it says. Let's go down to verse 47, <coughs> 47 through 50. And the kingdom of heaven. What do we know in this ministry about the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is for the Jews, right? It's for Judah. The kingdom of God is the third heaven and the um, uh, 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 paradise. Those are both part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is their promise of heaven on earth. So verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, a net being cast into the sea, and gathered of every kind. Huh. A net cast into the sea that gathers every kind of fish, and it relates to the end in the 14th year, or quote unquote, the 21st year, right? Which is to Matthew's group, which relates to, see this final year, which relates to Matt, John 21 and Matthew's, which is the kingdom of heaven at the end of days. Verse 48, which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels. Remember I told you to remember that? This word that's only used twice which when it was full, so the net that was cast into the sea for the portion of the time that is going to be of the kingdom of heaven, which is to Judah, which is heaven on earth, which is their portion, is this net cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, and it was so full, they drew it onto the shore. And when they gathered it, they gathered the good. See, and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. Hello. And so shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and, sir, and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire where uh, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. When? At the time when the kingdom of heaven is coming for Judah, the net is going to be cast into the sea. They're going to draw it onto the shore and all the good are going to be gathered into vessels. 
but cast the bad ones are going to be cast away. What is a vessel but a new body? A new body? So shall it be at the end of the world? And it just so happens that at the end of Matthew's discourse, which is the kingdom of heaven in the 14th year of trumpets, the wise ones who are what? The ones that have oil in their vessels are ready for when the Lord returns and the 14th year is complete, which to the Lord God is a typology of the millennial reign as a day to him as well. But what happens to those who are the foolish? They're the ones cast out of the net. They're the ones that when the door is shut, the hour has come, it's over. And what happens? Didn't it just say that they would be the ones that were cast out and that at this time would be what? The time of weeping and gnashing of teeth? Matthew 13 is the exact same story being given to us. It's the kingdom of heaven, the net being sent out. Where is the net sent out? Into the sea? A net sent out into the sea to a group of people that are going to be put into vessels where the bad ones are cast away, and so shall it be in the end of the world. And we were just in chapter 20 and saw that the sea portion isn't cast into the lake of fire, but death and hell are. And we see that Lazarus with Abraham, who are on the opposite side during this chasm between the one that was in hell, asking for them to bring water over to them. And every single one of these connections is a direct correlation to the 14th year of trumpets and a, or the 14th year of tribulation, that final year of trumpets when the Lord returns for the resurrection of the dead. And is, it is a 21,000 or a 14,000 final year. It is, it is a day to the Lord. It's represented as a one year tribulation, that final 14th year. And all of this related to the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives absolutely every single one 100 percent of the time is showing that the resurrection of the dead is happening at the end and what does john tell us in john chapter 21 everybody loves this right gerdas co fisher da, 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 da. john 21 verse 10 Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which thou have caught. Simon Peter went and drew the net to the land, full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty-three. And for all there were so many, yet not the net broken. I don't have the answer as to who these 153 represent. But as I'm speaking these words, I wonder, and I'm just speaking out loud here, I wonder if there's 153 Old Testament saints that are the great fishes represented by this casting of the net into the sea. That'll be what? Put into new vessels. Hello. That would be put into new vessels. Where the rest are being what? Cast into the furnace where there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. 
Look at this. It's the only place where the vessels are used. And both are directly related to the 14th year of trumpets when the Lord comes. Isn't that wild? You see, let's finish it off now with 1 Corinthians 15. And let's go to this wording that people are so confused with. Let's go to this final resurrection piece. Okay? Where is it? Where is it? Right? Where is it? Listen to this. Uh, you know what? Actually, let's even start back here. In 1 Corinthians 15, 42. <clears throat> so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in wickedness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. You see? There's no natural body needed. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthly. The second man is of the Lord heavenly. As is the earth, such are they that are earthly. Remember the ones formed by hand? And as they, uh, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as, and as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, right? The first two groups. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. When? At the last trump. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Why do you think there's a group being raised from the dead and there's a group that never died, meaning they made it through the tribulation and you get to the last trump when the seventh trumpet is about to sound, and what happens at the seventh trumpet? The resurrection of the dead. I just spent the last hour and a half plus showing you every single place where the resurrection of the dead is at the last trump. When the trumpet sounds, the mystery is over. And the reason for those being changed is because during the millennial reign, it'll be back as it was in the beginning. What did Isaiah 65 tell us? That even a child, if a child, if somebody dies at 100, it'll be as if they were a child. Why? Because during the millennial reign, people will live for hundreds of years again. That's why. Those who were still alive will be changed. And those who were dead shall be raised incorruptible, who were promised the millennial reign and who were to rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. You see? So 54, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be come to pass that which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Right to the end of the millennial reign. When death is now put under his feet. Brothers and sisters, 
This is the last trump. This is when the mystery from Revelation chapter 10 said, then the mystery of God is over. It is Revelation 11 at the seventh trumpet when now everything is the Lord and his Christ, when he shall rule forever and ever. He will reign. And what does it say? Look at this. That the time of the dead, that they should be judged. What is it in Matthew? What is the reason for Matthew's resurrection story to have them who resurrected from what? From a great earthquake that rent the rocks and the bodies of the saints in the graves. This is after his resurrection. Why? Because as you saw, the story of Jonah told us that Christ still must be in the grave. There must still be a period of time when he will be in the grave to free these people for three days and three nights, which means he will be resurrected on the fourth day at some point. And the only period of time in all of tribulation where we have after three days and after three nights is the two witnesses where after three days and a half is on the fourth day, which means what? Christ still will fulfill Matthew's Jonah of three days and three nights in the grave before what? He resurrects and a great earthquake happens at the very end of the sixth trumpet, and he returns at the sound, at the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, returns feet down on the Mount of Olives when everything is now his, and he will rule and reign forever. The only question is, why did he have to do it again? There's more than one reason. But the main reason that is not in today's video is in a video we have called Again. Christ has not fulfilled the prophetic implications of the story of Jonah from Luke, Mark, and Matthew because they are all connected to his coming for 40 days, his coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, and his death and resurrection at the end of the sixth trumpet, brothers and sisters, because Christ as Joshua is one of the two witnesses during the time of trumpets. Brothers and sisters, I hope that helps you understand the timing of the resurrection of the dead. There is no need for a pre-trib resurrection of the dead the only group that will be resurrected who was a part of the pre and mid is the group who worked during seals who will be resurrected at the when he returns at the seventh trumpet and they will rule and reign with them for a thousand years all of this complication has come about because we have all been taught for hundreds of years for generation after generation from a foundation and a perspective that is the gospel of Matthew and it has and it has twisted and distracted and deterred us from understanding why there's a pre mid and post why the seventh trumpet means the last trump it is the final trumpet blast when all of this will take place all of this has been twisted because of everybody's foundation from the gospel of Matthew and the failing of understanding and using the Strong's concordance with Esord to be able to understand 
these differences within the Gospels and seeing things like coming. Brothers and sisters, the resurrection of the dead is at the end of tribulation. Everybody pre and everybody mid. And for those that are part of those groups over the last 2,000 years, they are already with them and they are waiting for us. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.